let's, let's talk about the boys for a minute, because I feel like sometimes, uh, the, the internet, you know, wrestling community has their favorites and when they become, uh, sort of mobilized, it's like, Hey, he's our guy. And we're, we're all cheering for this one guy and, and we want him to do well and we want him to succeed. And we think he's great. He gets sort of a, a tag for, um, indie darling. And mm-hmm. so, and so I, I feel like whenever a guy comes in from the independence with a lot of hype and a big reputation, some of the other guys who are already in the locker room probably roll their eyes at that. And John Cena on that same DVD we referenced earlier said when he finally saw CM Punk after all the hype and reputation, he thought that's it. Is that a fair assessment that maybe some of the folks who are on the main roster, who perhaps aren't given an opportunity on TV every single week to really show what they're capable of. When a guy comes in from the Indies with a lot of hype and a big reputation, they're sort of looked at maybe a little sideways, like what's the big fucking deal. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it comes back to physique. Think about it. So as Cena said, and, this, and I didn't see the DVD, but I, I, I know I remember, I remember it and I remember it you know, selling pretty well, as a matter of fact, uh, but Cena's assessment was based on look. How can you, you can't make an assessment on somebody by saying, I finally saw this guy and I said, this is it. He didn't even know him. Hadn't met him. Didn't have a relationship with him. It's the eyeball test. And, you know, even though punk was great conditioned, uh, but he didn't have that bodybuilder's physique. Now I'll tell you, he started, he started getting, adding some bulk and, uh, uh, you know, his nutrition, I'm sure improved. And he started going to the gym more, uh, and, and working on his, uh, his body. But yeah, man, he's, uh, he, it was not fair in that regard. Uh, Hey, it's also the same thing. Go back and think about this in, uh, I think it was, when was it 2000 and he got a, here's the deal. A couple of things. Uh, he had a, he got a five-star match did punk with, with Samoa Joe by Dave Meltzer's wrestling observer newsletter that would get around. Some of the guys looked at that as a great accomplishment. And some of the guys who weren't getting those five-star ratings looked at it as bullshit. So a lot of little things like that made him that, as you mentioned, very uh, uh, accurately, the internet darling, but uh, to say, well, I saw him and this is it. He had not, he had not even seen John had not even seen punk work as far as I know. Right. So it's hard. How do you make an assessment on that? And as a responsible producer, why would you allow a talent to say something that's so uh, self-incriminating and, and it just didn't hold water. So I don't know how that worked either, but nonetheless, it goes back to the same thing, man. You talked earlier about triple H and Sean, not being big fans of punk. Were they big? Were they not big fans of punks because he didn't do drugs? No. Or drink? No. And by the way, triple H doesn't do drugs or drink either. So I didn't never understand that, but the deal was comes back. Does he have the look that, that we as in WWE covet for a spot on our roster or especially on a main event level situation. And that was where that came about right there. Just simply, he didn't have a bodybuilder physique, but he had the body of an athlete and a, as a wrestler. And then again, as I said, Conrad, when some of these cats saw how well he could work. And now he could adapt his style to incorporate with yours to make it a, a more seamless presentation than everybody wanted to work with him because they saw this son of a gun is really, really good. And he can make me look good and we can have some great matches. So let's talk about, uh, WrestleMania 23. It's his first WrestleMania with the company and, uh, he's well, where he's actually in a match and it's the uh, money in the bank ladder match. Big deal for him to qualify in that. Ultimately his number's not called there. Mr. Kennedy comes up successful, but the big thing we would see happen, uh, next or of note that we should bring up is the vengeance pay-per-view in June of that year. He was scheduled to face Chris Benoit for the ECW title. Uh, but we all know that the Benoit tragedy happened. And as a result, uh, that match does not take place. Johnny nitro is in the match instead. And nitro wins the match and becomes the ECW champion. And punk has said that he didn't feel like nitro was ready. He felt like 
he was more ready at the time, but that's the decision that was made. And you guys do eventually flip flop the title on, uh, so in September where punk would beat Morrison for the belt. Uh, and then in January of 2008, Chavo would beat punk with a little help from edge to win the ECW champion, but the championship uh, finally being around his waist and it being his first, uh, taste of gold in the WWE, even though it's not the original ECW, it is a reboot. And it is at a time when Heyman is not there writing it. It had to be, uh, kind of a cool moment because the original ECW would have been a great fit for punk. So the narrative about you that always floats around is that you're this grumpy, uh, unhappy person, especially in that time period. Was it unhappiness or was it that feeling of I'm fighting for my spot? Because I don't think a lot of wrestlers come with that mindset today, especially in WWE. I kind of compare it to NBA players versus Harlem Globetrotter players. One, they're fighting to be the best and the other, they're on the team and they know they're part of the troop. And I feel like I never have conversations with WWE guys today where they're like, I was in Madison Square Garden and this was the gate or the crowd was, the, the crowd was down. And your generation, I think you were one of the last guys to be obsessive compulsive about that, was what am I doing wrong? What can I do better? What are the houses? Where were they last time? And that narrative about you was like, oh, he was so hard to work with. He was such a pain in the ass. He was a miserable SOB. But who says that? It's just Twitter. Some kids, uh, Twitter on, the, some stories, kids, some kids on the internet that yeah, heard a so, hand, you know, like so, so, a story, like, you know, third hand. Like, hey. so, so my question to you is when you're in that moment, and you're trying to better yourself and you're trying to raise yourself to the highest level you can in WWE. How do you deal with those frustrations with all the archaic stuff that you just talked about? And how do you not let it get to you and prevent you from putting together the best performance that you can and putting on the best promo that you can and getting yourself into the position where they'll finally trust you, which took them some time. I don't think they ever trusted me. Um, uh, and I, I think the reason I loved wrestling so much is because when I was in the ring, bell to bell, I didn't have a boss. And I always said and did things in the context, especially of house shows, where I, I didn't have to run anything by anybody. I would literally just do stupid shit off the cuff. I remember when, um, so road, road to WrestleMania, I'm wrestling The Undertaker. And uh, the, the first week after I, I won the, maybe, maybe this is the genesis like of the for that Yeah, so like I, I, I remember saying this is a really stupid way to to wrestle the Undertaker at WrestleMania. And I forget who I forget who was writing at the time, but he got fired like right after that. Like whoever the creative person that was behind that, he was let go by the company like right like the next. I week. just thought it was a really weird like oh we're having this fatal four way to see who wrestles the Undertaker at. Uh, I it just it felt like a disconnect. I was like it's kind of weird, but whatever. I'm winning, okay. And like everybody in the match agreed, it was like Randy and Big Show. I was like, yeah, it's weird. Like, I don't know. But I and then I remember being in Indianapolis the next week, and I was wrestling Kane, and Michael Hayes comes up to me. He's like, all right, Kane, Spike, one, two, three, and I just went, huh? I was like, what? Okay, that's what we're doing. I'm wrestling the Undertaker in four weeks, and you just what are you guys gonna beat me every week? Like, what? and he's like, talk to Vince. <laughs> all right so i go talk to vince and vince looks me in the eye and he goes i've been doing this a lot longer than you pal trust me you're going to be more over as a heel when you after you lose and i was just like okay How do you I mean, argue that, that? at that point i was just like yeah all right not my it's not my fucking you know it's not my company but it's still me and like I said, I, it was an uphill battle to try to make this t match with The Undertaker feel like it wasn't so lopsided. I wanted to give reasonable doubt that, oh, shit, this guy could beat the streak. Uh, luckily enough, um, I did that wacky shit where I dumped fucking cat litter all over myself that was supposed to be Paul Bearer's ashes. And I think that kind of ramped it up. Well, yes, it was cat litter. Yeah, and uh, it wasn't used. I think the one later. guy was disappointed it was yeah. not actually his ashes. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm disappointed it wasn't really his ashes too. 
Um, so, you know, juggling things that way, like, always sucked. Because at the end of the day, I was like, well, you're the boss. It's not my company. But, like, you know, not to get political, I wasn't like, well, how about if I, I, be, I should beat Kane? Like, it wasn't that. It was just like, how about I don't lose clean while I'm trying to, you know, do this thing? It was just a difference of philosophy, I guess, you know. And he, he was like, oh, you're going to be much more over as a heel. And I, just, I literally, I just remember just being like, okay, all right. Was there ever a moment where you think Vince got you? No. Like, not even after the pipe bomb and the money in the bank with Cena in Chicago. Was there ever a moment where you, where, where you felt like, all right, I got him on my side now? No, I don't think so. Um, because it was always a fight. There was always a, a conversation. And I think that's kind of, like, that's the juice for Vince. You know what I mean? He wants to have those conversations and the personal relationship. And uh, I just, I don't think he ever understood me. You know what I mean? Like, I just, he never got me. Triple H never got me either. It was just, I'm just, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I, I did what I could. 